the end of our series on the New Testament identifying marks of the church. Today, I would like to, this morning and this afternoon, speak on the truth of the New Testament that salvation is in Christ's church. I want to, first of all, talk about this morning the idea that some put forth that persons who lead a good moral life are acceptable to God by their morality. They would live what we would call as respectable citizens with clean lives and thus in living that way they can go to heaven. One of the things that needs to be understood is that when you classify sin, it all comes under the heading of transgressing God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Either omitting what we must do or else breaking what God has told us. Now, when we look at that, we're going to see that there's moral sins and there are religious sins. We're just simply systematically breaking down the kind of sins that exist because they all violate God's will. They all separate you from God. But when we think of moral sins, we're talking about those sins that pertain to lying, we're talking about those sins that have to do with murder or theft or covetousness or drunkenness or drunkenness or waging. All those kind of things. Now watch it. A moral sin, a moral principle, let me put it that way, that is broken thus becomes sin. Moral sins are... Our moral right is right only in the nature of the case. When you read Romans 1 and it gives you the account, the inspired account by Paul of those Gentiles not desiring to retain God in their knowledge and how he gave them over to do various things, he'll mention several immoral acts. When you read of the works of the flesh, Paul gives in Galatians 5, then you'll read of immoral acts. But now not to offer the Lord's Supper and the worship assembly of the saint on the first day of the week is a failure and thus a sin to do what's been authorized that Christians are to do as part of their worship in the worship assembly. But it's not a moral sin. So we have categorized what we mean by moral principles, and the difference in them and religious sins or religious conduct. I think here, Ecclesiastes 1 and verse number 9 comes to bear. That which hath been is that which shall be, and that which hath been done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. That was said and written down many thousand years ago. You may see things appear that look different, but when you strip them down to their reality, there's no new thing under the sun as far as sin is concerned. The apostle John talked about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, and says that Christians are to remove themselves from those things. And we are taught one way or the other to put these appetites to death or separate ourselves from them. So let's just suppose that here is a person who does not commit murder, who is not a thief, who is not covetous, who tells the truth, who doesn't commit adultery, who's not a drunkard, or anything connected with drug abuse. He's not a gambler. He's a good, moral man. Will that conduct allow him to go into heaven? 
Well, the Bible has many things to say about the fact that such is not the fact. If you talk about a good moral man today, you probably have to define good and moral and maybe even man. Because what was good and moral 50 years ago in general in the public is not today. We well, say there's something new, and Solomon said there wasn't anything new under the sun. Well, as far as I know, sodomy, sodomy is a whole lot older than about anything we know of today in this land. And it's even older than the first century, and so on you can go. Paul will discuss it in the departure of the Gentiles from God as those that did those things that were unnatural. So it's a sin for a man and a woman to commit adultery, but there's this unnatural sin where a man and a man commit adultery and a woman and a woman commit adultery. It's all adultery, but some function within the way nature made people and others function contrary to the way that people are made. God has always frowned more, if you could use that terminology, on those people who have violated the natural order of things. He'll talk about wives not having natural affection or parents not having natural affection. That which is peculiar to you as a human being made in the image of God. The stamp of God's morality is on your spirit. There is that sense of oughtness. Where did it come from? Because we're made in the image of God. Not our fleshly bodies, but our inward man, our spirits. And just read through your Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. And you'll see that while God hates all sin, watch how he deals with those who go against their very nature to sin against him. So today I have to even qualify what is it to be a good moral person. But I'm saying since salvation is in Christ's church, being a good moral person as the Bible would define good moral in person will not get one into heaven, will not get one to pay attention to the gospel of Christ. And we must remember that the gospel of Christ is God's power to save. Romans 1 16. So you can be a good moral man, but you must remember too what Paul said to the Romans. All that's good moral people, you know. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 and 6.23. So good moral people sin also. So just being a good moral person is not enough. Salvation is in Christ's church. If being a good moral person would save, then Christ, or rather man would have been saved, a good moral person, would have been saved without Christ coming into the world. But John 3 and verse 17 says Christ came to save people. And he doesn't differentiate between good moral people or any other sinner. One should be saved apart from Christ's stripes, if you please. But the Bible said in the prophecy of him 700 years before he came in Isaiah uh, uh, chapter 51 makes it clear, 53 rather, makes it clear that uh, his stripes came upon him, not because of any sin he did, but for our benefits. And with his stripes we are healed. And Peter echoes him in 1 Peter 2 and verse 24. That is, Christ died for all. Christ suffered for all. Christ shed his blood for all. Christ purchased the church with his blood. In the Lord's Supper, we commemorate that act on his part. If good moral people are saved, and that's all it takes, then a person could be saved without the death of Christ. 
But the Bible is very clear that he died for our sins, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. You cannot preach the gospel of Christ without preaching that Christ died for our sins. Paul also has this to say in Romans 4 and verse 25 is that Christ was raised from the dead for our, remember he's writing to the church, for our justification. But if just being a good moral man, even as the Bible would define a good moral man, then there would be no need for Christ to be raised from the dead. There would be no need for Christ to have been buried. There would be no need for him to die on the cross. There would be no need for him then to come into the world. If a good moral person is saved, then one would be saved apart from the very blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. And the Bible is full of material that says that blood was shed for the remission of our sins. Paul told the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 that we have our redemption through Christ's blood. If man can be saved as a good moral man, then you could please God without faith. But the scripture says without faith it's impossible to please God, Hebrews 11 and 6. Remember, people can be good moral people without knowing a thing about the New Testament. An atheist can be a good moral person. It's not because he really takes the implications of his atheism and applies it in every phase of life. But an atheist pays bills, loves his wife and family, and do all those particular things like we talked about a moment ago. But he denies the existence of God. He doesn't believe in God. But that has nothing to do directly with moral conduct. One could be saved if one could be saved by morality alone without repenting. For what would there be to repent of? And the scripture is very clear that we are to repent or we perish, Luke 13, verse 3. That's a resolve of my heart. To turn away from things that are wrong. Well, if all there is, is morality. That means principles that are done in the very nature of the case. Then how, how is it that you would need what Christ came to do? If man could be saved just by being moral, he could actually deny Christ and be saved. But the scripture is clear in Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, that if you deny Christ, you'll be denied before the Father. Remember, sin's moral and sin's religious. All are sin, but they simply describe the nature of the sin. If morality alone, being a good moral person, would save you, then you would be saved without being baptized. But Peter is clear on the matter that baptism does also now save us, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. I remember one time many, many years ago that I had been to Syracuse, New York to knock doors, try to set up Bible studies because the church was exceedingly weak in that part of the world. I came back home on one of the buses. I don't know if it was a Greyhound or whatever it was, which was some story of itself to travel that far <laughs> on a bus. But I remember the first leg of the journey, there was a man, and I, I was 18, I guess, then. There was a man who I sat beside, who I suppose at that time would have been in his 50s. And we visited and found out he uh, was superintendent of schools somewhere around Chicago and that uh, we began to talk about religion a little bit 
And he says, well, I believe you just have to be a good moral person. And I asked him, I said, well, then how do you view the Bible? I assure you then I didn't know as much of how to handle things like that as I do now. But I did ask him that. Then what purpose is the Bible? In fact, when you talk about, I said, morals, what do you mean? And, of course, he went into some of these things like we're talking about that we define to be moral characteristics. I said, you know, every one of those is incorporated in the Word of God, the Bible. So how do you know about those things? How did you come to understand them? Well, he never answered me. Nice fellow, best I could tell. <laughs> what you can learn from a person sitting by them on a bus for a while. But nevertheless, you can see the man didn't understand. I recognized that rather quickly. I wish then that I had known, as I know now, I would have pursued things probably much further, but I didn't. But it was enough to take care of that situation. He didn't want to talk about it anymore, be that as it may. But if good moral people can be saved without being in Christ and doing what's necessary to get into Christ, then what is the purpose? of most of what the New Testament teaches. If good moral people can be saved, then they can be saved without being born again. But we find from John 3, 3 and 5 that man must be born again. If a good moral person can be saved alone, then we can be saved without obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that that involves. Hearing the word, understanding it, honestly applying it, having our faith, trust, belief, and confidence in God and Christ and the gospel system that it can save us and so forth. But the scripture says that Christ will render vengeance to them that obey not the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8. If a person can be a good moral man and be saved, then that means they can be saved without being converted. Sadly, I think there have been some of these in the church. They say, in the church? What do you mean in the church? Well, God knows the hearts of all people. It's the Lord that does the adding to the church. We can only see the fruits that they bear out in their lives. But what I mean by that is simply some seemingly have the idea if they go through the motions or the obedience to the plan of salvation... Then if they just live a good moral life, everything's going to be all right because they mark their salvation at the point of baptism and then they don't think much different than anybody else after that. Well, that's a shame. But I remind you again, most of the New Testament is written to members of the church regarding their responsibilities in being faithful to Christ. If a good moral person can be saved, then we see that a person can be saved without being converted. Matthew 18, 3 makes it clear you have to be converted to enter the kingdom of heaven. If a good moral person could be saved ignorant of the truth of the gospel of Christ, then what's the need of us here this morning? Why preach the gospel to every creature? What good would it do? None whatsoever. A good moral person can be saved anyway. And yet we read in John 8, verses 31 and 32, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. But if you can be saved just by being a good moral person, then that means you can be saved without even loving the truth of the gospel. But those who love not the truth, according to Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10, are going to perish. That one reason people do not know their Bible, know the truth recorded in the words of the Bible, is because they don't love the truth. I think one of the greatest things you can do for yourself is cultivate that love for God's truth. Love for spending time with the Word of God that reveals that truth. Love for walking in the truth. If a good moral person can be saved in his morality, then he can be saved apart from Jesus Christ. 
But it's interesting that Jesus, talking about the vine and the branches, said, apart from me, ye can do nothing, John 15, 5. Well, it's obvious the moral man can do something. So nothing in what way? Nothing that's pleasing to God. Nothing that's going to save your soul from sin. Nothing that's going to reconcile you to God. Nothing that's going to justify yourself in God's sight. Nothing that's going to save you from your sins. This should, at this point in our study, and we're not going to spend much longer in it, this should cause us to ask, am I living in the church calling myself faithful to Christ as a Christian, but really I'm basically just living a moral life? You watch people in the church and you ought to. They're your brothers and sisters in Christ. We're commanded to be our brother's keeper and to care for them. And you see how many of them don't like it when certain things are said. From the standpoint, well, I'll just take the elders, for example. I have never been in a church from my youth up where there weren't people who complained about the decisions the elders made, no matter how righteous the elders were and qualified, and no matter if they weren't working properly in their sphere, which is primarily and fundamentally in the area of what is the most expedient way to carry out this obligation God has laid upon the church to do. But I should really not be surprised at that, and I'm not now that I know my Bible, and I haven't been for a long time. Because in the days of Moses, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, poor people among the Israelites, told Moses, in his word being the final say-so, that you take too much on yourself. Or to put it in the colloquial term that some might use, you're too big for your britches. Korah, Dathan and Abiram said that. Well, let's see. My memory tells me that when God got through with them, the earth opened up and swallowed every one of them. Oh, that was written aforetime for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. When it comes down to the things of which we speak, obviously those are religious matters. They had nothing to do totally with moral conduct, although when they worshiped the golden calf, they remember Aaron said, people forced me to, and I put that gold in the fire and out hopped the calf. That also sounds like brethren sometimes too. Uh, we go through life making decisions. And most of the time, if not the high percentage of the time, we don't slip, slide into sin. We line up and march into it. And that's a shame. And one of those things is, is that we think we can just live on the moral plane. And we ignore the religious instruction, such as the organization of the church. The work of the church. The worship of the church. And those things that are peculiar to being a Christian. That is, even in the home, as we've been studying in our auditorium class, of forming it according to the instructions of God. That's going to involve morality. But it's also going to involve religious matters. I remember one preacher, J. Roy Vaughn. John, you may remember his name. He's very popular back in uh, Nashville. His son came along later. But Brother Vaughn wrote a lot of the gospel. I have getting wrote a lot of their teaching literature. And I remember hearing him nearly 50 years ago, if not 50 years ago, at Three Harmon Lectures, saying when his son was a little boy at the beginning of World War II and everybody's talking about the Japanese bombing Pearl Harbor and all the turmoil, sometimes we forget if we ever knew that the first six to nine months of that war, the United States was walking on eggshells is what the Japanese were going to do about invading the West Coast. But um, be that as it may, he got up one morning and his boy was small enough and raised in a good godly family, but he didn't want to go to church. 
He shows you how kids pick up on things. He was grumbling around and his daddy making him get ready and say, get yourself in there, boy, and straighten up and get your clothes on, blah, 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 all those things that go along with the territory. And he says, I just wish those Japanese just bombed that old church building. <laughs> so people have ways in given situations that are going on at the particular time. I don't know, maybe somebody's saying, I wish the coronavirus would descend upon the church and get rid of them. Who knows what it'll be tomorrow? But the point is, you live today faithful to God because of moral conduct as the Bible regulates it, but also because of the religious teachings concerning what it is to be faithful to the Lord in the church, its organization, its worship, and in daily Christian living. And when you have the organization of the church, then you have elders when it's fully organized. And you have deacons. And you have preachers. So these things are vitally important. The point I'm making this morning that salvation is in the church is that if morality is all there is, then you don't need any of these things. One could be saved apart from Christ's name with their salvation in no other name, according to Acts 4.12. A person could be saved out of the body of Christ, but Christ is the Savior of the body, Ephesians 5 and verse 23. We'll talk about that more this afternoon. A good moral person, if that's all that's needed, then look at Cornelius while he approached God under patriarchy. Nevertheless, the best we can read about him, he was a good moral man. But what he was under and how he was approaching God wasn't going to suffice. And now that the full scheme of redemption had been performed, he needed to hear the gospel. And he needed to obey it in order to be saved. Acts 11 and 14. Morality is tremendously important. And the Bible teaches morality as well as it teaches anything else pertaining to faithful service to God. But if you knew all there is about morality and lived strictly a moral life, there would be so many things pertaining to Christianity that you could leave out and never be concerned about. Worshiping God, worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. The items there, such as I mentioned the Lord's Supper. The authorized music, singing and singing only. The kind of songs sung, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Speaking to one another in those songs. Singing and making melody in our heart unto the Lord. You see, you can be a good moral person and not do any of those things. So we need to be concerned about morality indeed. And you will be when you preach the whole W-H-O-L-E counsel of God. Many years ago, and we have this out here, and I picked it up while ago in our track rack. They would refer to the looseness that has become quite common today as the new morality. Well, I suggest to you it's not new. In reality, this was a sermon that Brother V. Howard preached, and he would give his sermons out in track form if you'd write from them for them. And this is one we have back there. But the truth of the matter is there's nothing new under the sun. And whatever immorality is out there, it's always been around where people have been around and done their own things on the level of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life. But one cannot be saved apart from Christ's church. Salvation is not in morality. Salvation is in Christ. And we'll study more about that this afternoon. If you're not a child of God, we've studied in this morning's sermon what it takes to become a child of God. We urge you to believe and from the heart obey it. And rise from that watery grave of baptism more than just living on the moral level, but on the spiritual level of doing all things God enjoins upon you because you're now in Christ for you were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. If as a child of God you've considered one thing maybe more important being a good moral person. But then in the matter of being religious, that just sort of fall, falls into the area of options. Well, it doesn't. 
All of it's important. The whole counsel of God teaches all of it. If you need to repent of any sins of that nature, then we urge you to do so while we stand and sing.